Hello. Hey, Mary. Okay, so the screen behind me is that is that is that correct or? I don't know what you want it to look like. I, I want want you to be able to read it. Can you read it? Yes. It is correct. It's not backwards. It's all fine. Okay. All right. Great. It's correct, John. I... Thanks. Thanks to Simon Dix. I could put this guy behind me. He was the. Uh, oops. Now I've now I've lost the one I was supposed to have. Um. So. Uh oh. Is this one? No, that's backwards, right? Now it's backwards, yes. Now it's frontwards. It's fine now. Okay, great. Thank you very, very much. Um, you need to adjust the angle of your computer, your screen. Uh, down a little there. That no, now you're too low. Up a little. Okay. Also <laughs> I can just sit up or I can slouch, <laughs> you know. So all right. That's good so. right there. Um, I've got everybody muted right now. Um, as you come on, the, the deal is that it's muted because there's ba always background noise. Somebody's got a barking dog or a pot of tea that's boiling or something or other. Um, a pot of what? A pot of tea that's boiling oh, or tea. something. I thought you said cheese. I said, who boils not, cheese? Not a pot of cheese, no. So anyway, we've got lots of, lots of people on. We've got 35 people on so far. I was talking to a guy today from California and uh, FaceTiming with him to help him. No, guy from Texas, uh, FaceTiming with him on the phone, uh, helping him get his front suspension apart. And um, a, a call came in from Germany. So I, I told the guy in, in uh, Texas, I said, I'll call you back. So I don't know, we'll, maybe we'll get, uh, we'll get this guy in from from uh, Germany and Barbara's on tonight. Hey, Barbara. So, so anyway, and, and as it turns out, I mean, besides, um, besides Gmail being down right now, or at least parts of Gmail being down, things have been going on apparently um, through Constant Contact and with GoDaddy, or at least on my site, because I had a lot of people complain and say, hey, you know, dude, I put in my name and, and I punched the button that said, join our newsletter and nothing happened. So my, my daughter, Barbara, who's on the screen here, um, said, well, she'd look into it, but um, somebody had scrambled up our, our, uh, our login information. So by tomorrow, that ought to be sorted out correctly. So I, I trust. I trust. So I'm over on the chat. So, oh boy, we already got a really good technical one here about a speed opinion in his TD. So good. Um, anyway, we're waiting for seven o'clock to come around. If you've got something to, to weigh in about, you can unmute yourself. You know, it's okay. We've got, uh, 52 people on so far, as long as everyone doesn't unmute themselves at the same time, it shouldn't be too, too bad. So I looked tonight to, uh, to see where I was as far as, as uh, views on YouTube, and now it's up to 8.8 .8 million. Thank you very kindly. I do get a small check from Google every, every month. I don't know, one, Ten thousandth of a cent or something per view, but anything times eight point eight million is something. So thank you very kindly for uh, viewing on those. And um, if you ever have a question about my videos or you're doing something and you can FaceTime, I'm available. You can call me up, and I'm more than happy to walk you through some difficult problem or or something. So. Anyway, it, it, it should work out. It should work out very well. Um, I want to say too, I actually should wait until seven o'clock and then get, get going with all the official announcements. So, so Quentin Reader, hey, I see you're, you're logged in. Quentin, thank you very much. So Quentin's got an MGC. It was last on the road uh, about 30 years ago something like that whenever his son graduated from from high school 
and uh, the engine is frozen, appeared to be frozen. And so, you know, it's got to take off the starter and take the distributor out of the way so you can get a big lever on the, on the flywheel and turn it after soaking it and so forth. And uh, he brought me the starter motor and we took it apart and lubed it and cleaned the brushes and everything so we won't have to do it again. And then he brought me the also at the same time the distributor and I took the cap off and looked in there and thought, that's my work. So it's always fun to recognize your own work. I got a particular way I wind, I wind the low tension lead and the condenser lead on the inside of the distributor. So I knew it was my own work, let alone the red grease on the cam. We're up to 72 people and it's seven o'clock. So we're gonna, we're gonna start. So anyway, thank you everyone, um, ladies and gentlemen for logging in tonight and getting involved in another exciting, uh, an, another exciting Zoom session. Um, if huh? you or your club wants to have me do a Zoom session, I'm more than happy to. Just contact me, and I'm I'm more than pleased to to work something out. Um, we can do it. So as I said just a little bit earlier, we're up to um, 8.8 .8 million views on my YouTube list. I still haven't publicly thanked so many people for your do your your donations. Um, I started tonight to print that list off so I could at least mention some names, but I shan't for fear of leaving out the other 97, 970. There have been a lot of people who, who've donated. It's very kind. Thank you everyone for doing so. That's It helps me out, certainly helps me afford my retirement. I think that's what it says on the website. And it also makes it a, a real pleasure to, to, do these, to do these Zoom events. So tonight, um, well, first of all, Bob Haskell, uh, who's got a, he's a Healy guy, um, but he, he's on the end of constant contact. And I sent that out with that. With, I didn't have a, a clickable link to mouse the man and the MGB because the last time I did it, I did it wrong. And then I was afraid that everybody would log into my, my own Amazon account. So I didn't, I didn't put in the exact, exact, um, I'm gonna mute everybody just cause I got some background noise. Um, and um, anyway, Bob Haskell wrote in and said that he followed um, he went on to Amazon, followed my link on Amazon, typed in Mouse the Man in the MGB and got a hit on it. And underneath the book, uh, there's a little line down there that said, customers who purchased this book also bought, and it was a case of Valvoline 2050 VR1 oil. So apparently the people buying the, the MG book for their grandchildren um, um, are also buying motor oil. And that's always a good thing. So, I want to talk about restoration just as a startup tonight, um, about restoring a car. And I, I had a guy call me just the other day, and he just bought an MGA, which someone else had totally disassembled. And he hadn't had it for six months or two years, something not very long, and was sort of hunting around to see who might be able to restore it or help him out with it or so forth. And um, the only time that you restore a vehicle is when that vehicle has huge in, in sort of intrinsic value to you. It belonged to yourself when you graduated from high school. Your father who's passed away gave it to you. Your brother who went in the army um, in Vietnam and, and bought it just before he left and was killed there. That was his car. Something, you met your wife in it. You had your first date in it. You've had it forever. Some reason that the car takes on a, a greater value to you than just the expense, uh, expense of nuts and bolts, which it, after all, truly is. So you don't restore a car unless it has great value to, to you or unless you love the process. And it's the process which has captured most of us. I mean, how much fun is it? I mean, you take something off your car, whether you're still in the workforce or whether you're retired, if you're in the workforce and, and you're stuck in middle management, you got some great idea, you send it up the wire um, 
six months later, it comes back and the guys upstairs say, no, nah, it isn't a good idea. Well, you know it is. Or worse, it, it comes back down and your boss takes credit for it. So instead of being frustrated with, with business and management, pushing paper or something or other, you can go to your car and you can take something off that car and take the air cleaners off and sandblast them and paint them or get excited, get them powder coated and put them back on the car and it's like, yes, yes, you've made this great big improvement on the car. It's only, only for your eyes. So you either have to have a car that has intrinsic value or you love the process. So either case, you're looking at restoration and it's either a lot of money or a long time or both. Um, you wouldn't, help me out, you just wouldn't buy a car that was rusty for $500 this spring, this, this past fall, and then go to a shop and pay that shop, I don't know, 20, 40, 80, $100,000 to restore it. I had um, a person who once asked me, why would someone spend $100,000 restoring a car that's only worth $20,000. And my response always was, well, do you know anyone who owns a cat? I mean, a cat's, I, the cheapest thing you can do with a cat is put a, a, meet it with a 22 bullet and go out and get another one if there's anything wrong with a cat, you know, but there are cat psychiatrists and there are cat, people spend enormous amounts of money on their cat because they love their cat. And that's why you'd spend an enormous amount of money on your MG if you love your MG. And on top of that, the MG doesn't die and you can keep fixing it forever, unlike cats. So what's an MG cost to restore, really? I mean, what are you talking about? A restoration, dropping it off? We had every now and then at my shop, University Motors, we'd have somebody would drop off a car and they just say, do it, do it completely. And it's like, hey, you're, you're my man. What a deal. Um, go for it. But boy, I sure would run them through the ringer first and make sure that this is what they wanted to do because it's always cheaper, always less expensive, absolutely, to put a garbage, give your car to your next door neighbor and go out and buy another one that's in absolutely beautiful condition. And you'll save so much money doing it. But if it's your own car, you can't do that. Some people get even get, get excited and say, well, I, I gotta have my original carburetors back on my car. I can't, I can't take another set that looks exactly like mine. I gotta have my carburetors. But how far do you take that? You still gonna put air in the tire that, that was uh, when they were inflated at Abingdon, England. And besides that was 50 years ago. So how can you get 50 year old air? I mean, there, there is a limit to, to how original you, you want to be. So a lot of cars get restored because you get into it, because you start it, because you take it apart and then you're in. And, and, uh, and then over a period of time, you go, I'm going to make this really, really nice. And the car gets easily over restored. You know, the carburetors didn't look that nice when it came from the factory. The paint, I was just, I just had a guy, uh, Mr. Ullman, who sent me a note and said, you know, please don't paint your car and make it look shinier than turtle wax could make it look in 1973. You know, that's, that's cheating, you know, but it's your car. What, you know, it's your car, whatever you want to do with it. I always said that if someone wanted uh, to take an MGB and, and paint it purple and put pink polka dots on it, I'd say, how big are the polka dots and how many do you want? You know, I mean, I'll, I'll do it, but I try to talk them out of it first. So I'm trying to talk people out of restoring a car. If all you want is a car to drive, that's nice. Just go out and buy one, get a job making pizzas and you'll, you'll have less time invested after you've saved up 15 grand to buy a really, really nice MGB. Um, not, I just heard of an MGB that sold for, 30,000 bucks, it's the highest value of one I know of. I mean, you hear rumors, but, and I, I, haven't, I haven't gone through the stuff on bringing a trailer. Actually, I did the other day. And I think I saw one way up like at 
45 grand or something. I don't know if that was sold or what, but um, anyway, 30 grand. Anyway, for 15 grand, you can get yourself a really, really nice MGB. Not a BV-8, not an MGC, but just a regular B. So if you're gonna restore it yourself, instead of getting another one, then again, consider. We had a guy with a head of TF and he, he lived over in, I don't know, Bay City, Saginaw, Eastern part of the state of Michigan. And he wanted to get his car all restored. When we got it over, it really wasn't that bad. And I said, look, um, instead of you know taking the car apart and painting it, and today, painting an MGB is anywhere from 10 to 20 grand. Well, it was some body work. Um, instead of doing that, I said, why don't we just take everything off the car? This is a TF. So there's a lot of stuff with a lot of adornments on a, on a TF. MGBs look better the more stuff you take off them, but a T-type looks better the more stuff you put on it. Anyway, take off the door handles and the windscreen and and uh, all the rubber gaskets and the lamps and so forth like that. And then buff it out, just buff it, make it look as, maybe touch it up, some big chips. Um, buff it out, make it look as nice as you possibly can. And then go ahead and put on clean, the cleaned up chrome and all the new rubber gaskets. And geez, that thing's got this fake patina um, it, that people come over and go, oh my gosh, you've really taken care of this car because it looks like you've taken care of it because the gaskets aren't all, all cruddy with, with turtle wax left over from the first time you polished it in 1974, still stuck in the cracks of the, of the broken, uh, of the broken uh, gaskets and so forth that fit underneath the lamps and the motifs. So if you're in for it, if you want to do it, go for it, go for it. No more fun than restoring a car. Oh my gosh. But don't reinvent the wheel. All the information's out there. Anything you want to do to your car, no matter what you want to switch from disc wheels to wire wheels, wire wheels to disc wheels, put in a Japanese gearbox, put a V8 in it, whatever you want to do. The stuff has already been done at least once. And that person's written it up and put it someplace on the web or through one of the clubs, and the clubs all have their, their technical sections from the magazines, so all, all on downloadable uh, formats through CDs and stuff like that. So don't reinvent the wheel. It, you know, read, 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 read. Buy yourself the factory parts manual, the factory workshop manual, and as many aftermarket manuals, I know mine's not available yet, um, as many aftermarket manuals as you can possibly come up with because knowledge is power. Once you've, once you've got it sorted out and you've decided, yes, this is what I'm gonna do. I am gonna put a new interior in the car. I'm just gonna buff it, but I'm gonna rebuild the front and rear suspensions and some stuff like that. Then open up your Moss catalog. No point, throw away that Victoria secret, um, British Victoria uh, catalog because Moss, Moss bought uh, Victoria British, we're all aware of that, I'm sure, and Victoria British no longer exists. So open up your Moss catalog or whatever catalog you have and get your yellow highlighter out and strip out every single part that you think you're gonna want and order it all at the same time. This is after you've decided that, yes, you're, you're in, in for a penny, you're in for a pound, you're gonna do it. So you order up all the parts to start with and you get you make this enormous parts order. I mean, an easy thousand, two, three, four thousand dollars worth of stuff. And now you've made a commitment. Now you you're forced to continue on with your project. Now this stuff will start coming in. You'll get ninety percent of it, ninety five percent of it. But some of some of it will be on back order. For instance, I'm trying to fit the the tail lights onto my daughter's. 73 BGT and I don't have the gaskets and the gaskets aren't there. Well, I haven't ordered this week. Been a real problem with supply, but some stuff's gonna go on back order. And if you order it today, then maybe the day that you need it, it will have already come in. You don't have to wait for it yet again. And here comes the most important thing I'll say about restoration tonight, absolutely. And after you, after you hear this, you can just, close on your computer because it's the best information you're gonna get all day. Do one part at a time. Take off, choose something. 
the right rear tail light. What are you going to do to it? You know, on your MGB, on your MGA. What, what are you going to do to it? Are you going to polish it? Are you going to put a LED bulb in it? Are you going to put a new lens on it? You got new gaskets? One of the bullet connectors is uh, is is gone. You're gonna you're gonna solder or crimp a new bullet connector on the end of the wire. What are you gonna do to it? Whatever you're gonna do to it, do to it completely. And then, as an assembly, with all the nuts and bolts that go with it, and all the brackets and all the all the um, clips and clamps, put it together loosely, wrap it up in plastic so you can tell what it is, and put it up on the shelf and then take the second thing off the car and do it. And that way you won't get in too deep. I did talk to a guy today from Texas, uh, from San Antonio, and he's moving to Houston. And he has a car which is extremely apart. So um, if you've already done every single thing, then um, all you have to do is move boxes of completed parts. But if you're moving boxes of incomplete parts, let me tell you, they go missing. Um, just like buying a car. Somebody says, oh, I've got a car, you know, I took it all apart 13 years ago. I don't know. choose a car, a TF, an MGA, an MGB. I took it all apart, but it's all here, they say. And they believe it's, they truly believe it's all there, but it's not. It's not. Some of those parts have gone to the dump already. Some of them are stuck in a corner in the attic. The guy ain't going to see it till he sells the house, if then. So, just do one part at a time. Take off one part and do it. Do it completely. Go round and round and round the car. And then when you get all the way down to as far as you're going, then you can start to reassemble the car. And that's the fun, that's the fun part of it when you when all the bits and pieces are completed. So that's my that's my talk about, about uh, restoration. Carl Heidemann and I used to go to um, Carlisle, Pennsylvania, to the big import show there. When it was big, it's no longer quite so big. And and um, I had a seminar that I called um, "How to Restore Your British Car in an Hour." And these people would come up and say, "How do you restore a British car in an hour?" I said, "Oh no, you can't restore it in an hour. That's how long the that's how long the class is." So anyway, I went into some more detail than I did now. But the most important thing, one part at a time is the uh, is the bottom line so so think heavily before you start going for a uh, for a car to do think about what you want to do arm yourself with a lot of information and anyway so that's that's my notes about about restoration so i've got some stuff over here in the chat section and i think I'm, i'll take that if you've got a question in chat um you can if you got a question you put it over on chat and that's the bottom ribbon and um, if you've got something to add, if I've forgotten something, just unmute yourself and, and uh, uh, add, add something to the discussion. So Judd, is Judd here with the, with the TD Speedo? Where's Judd? Unmute yourself, Judd. Hey, John. Oh, okay. All right. Here, here we go. So Judd oh says God. in the chat section, he put a new Speedo pinion in his TD gearbox. Uh, he used the existing housing. It seems that transmission oil seeps through the housing and up the speedo cable. Is there supposed to be a seal of some sort in that housing? No, there is no seal. It's just it's a it's about two inches long, and it's just, it, you know there's that but something's worn out through that capillary action. But help me out, someone someone makes a seal that goes in there. Someone I talked to um, was had a seal something but you can get no i know what i did i saw in the new housings they made new housings and i think it was ntg specialists in ipswich england had brand new housing you know it's probably 78 pounds or something i mean call it 100 bucks it's like how much is that oil leak worth but if you have to share your garage with with someone who doesn't like oil on the floor then it doesn't matter what it costs it's not, I don't mind the oil on the floor. You haven't seen my shop, but uh, I had this speedometer redone by Nozinger, came back immaculate, worked beautifully, and then it stopped again. And I said, well, that's not right. And I sent it off to them and they informed me that it was full of uh, transmission oil. So, okay. and, and they had to start from scratch. And I mean, they did the work 
uh, I had to pay them. So if I had to pay $100 for a new housing versus paying 250 to Nossinger every six months, yeah. that's what I would go with. Okay, well, anyway, um, uh, NTG, November, Tango, Golf, NTG Services in Ipswich, England. I think it's got new ones. Moss may have new ones, too. I don't, I don't know. Um, if you buy a used uh, one, what, what are you going to get again? A used one. They do unscrew. They do unscrew. Right. Um, but I don't, I'm just certain that there's no seal in there unless someone else knows better than <coughs> I do. Okay. Thank you very much. By the hey. way, this is, I don't know if you can see the image behind my face, yes. but that's my new, uh, the engine's on the bench right now, and that's the new roller cam lifters. Oh, you got the roller cam from uh, um, in from California? Lynn. Lynn. Lynn up in New York. Oh, okay. All right. Yep. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my and gosh. It, it looks real nice. I can see the earphones, but through the earphones, I can see, I can see your eyes, too. But yeah. through all that, I, I, I can see that, that XPAG engine behind you. So, yeah. Very it, cool. Uh, I've got it put together. It runs real smooth. I'm going to have the club come over and we're going to stick it in and see if it'll run. Very nice. So break in, break in is always like a really, really important first step. And I just talked to a guy today. He said, how many miles you got on your engine? He said, one. I said, okay, well, stop, stop and, and break it in. I don't know about roller cams and, and zinc. I don't. It's supposedly roller cams don't need as much zinc as a is a um, flat tappet cam, but in the case of a flat tappet engine, which most of us have, because most of us don't have roller cams, um, open up, you open up the valve lash to about 30 thousandths, just a lot, just a lot. Doesn't have to be exact, but around 30. And then start the car up and bring the revs up to, uh, just with your idle screws. So it's idling around 2000 RPM and let it run like that for 20 or 30 minutes. That's the break-in. It's just great. Sets the cam. Everything's great because you've got that tr dramatically loose clearance. Um, the push rods can spin and the lifters can spin. I know on your car, Judd, the lifters better not spin. Um, uh, but anyway, the, the, on normal cars. So I, I don't know what the, what the, the break-in is on that cam. but, but well, it, They recommend uh, that you do use high zinc initially, but you don't need it after that. But I buy my high zinc oil by the case for my three MGs. And this is the only one that's got the roller lifters. So I'm going to just use it anyway. It's not that much more. Yeah, it's it's so uh, we used to use Brad Penn. That's what I'm using. Okay. All right. That's you got to buy that by the case. You can't buy it by that by the individual, but you can buy Valvoline VR1. Uh, is what about? Okay, if I have uh, say Brad Pitt in there, and I need a quart of oil, or, or for instance, I've got a, a spare quart of uh, a different kind of oil. What's your thought on on uh, mixing oils? All those dinosaurs died for us. I I, th I think oil's oil. I don't. I'm not an engineer. Oil isn't oil. Gosh, if some some uh, engineer get, gets on here, you, you'll tell me I'm all wet. But it's better to have. It's better to have oil than no oil, right? And then it's better to have the right oil than the wrong oil. But um, you know, I I don't I mix oils a lot. I, I just don't see that there's a problem do, doing that. You know, you end up changing the oil every year anyway. Right. Um, so. Okay. Well, thanks, John. It's hey, always John. a pleasure. Hey, it's great. So thank you very very much. Okay, Kevin Edwards. Uh, to everyone, Kevin, are you on here? Yeah, Kevin, right here. So you you got it says big update. I got the, <laughs> I got the new water pump, but it was harder than I thought. Harder to change it, I expect. Yeah, you guys, you know, I've told you I'm not a major mechanic like some of you guys with this. So, but you know, the water pump turned out to be a deal. The um, first of all, you know, you told me last time take out the radiator. I did that, but then when I put it back on, one of the lower bolts just didn't seem to reach. I mean, I struggled and struggled, you know, there are four and the one down here, just, I could not get that to reach the block for the longest time, it, you know, and finally I did after just endless putzing around and finally got it tight enough on there, but I don't know if there's a better way to do that in the future, it just, mine just didn't reach, you know, 
It's well, the, the, bolt, the bolt should come out of the. Um, there's my J. C. Taylor. Uh, the the bolt the bolt should should come out of the out of the back of the pump by, by about half an inch. Okay. You know? And uh, and I was telling everybody to make sure that you know on anything having to do with water, which is the water pump, the the heater control. This is on your MGA. That's that in your background. Yes. Yeah. Um, on the water pump and the thermostat housing and the heater control valve, just gob grease onto those gaskets. Just gob the grease and put a lot of grease on the on the bolts. Now you want to be really cool. You'd put anti seize on the bolts, but that stuff <laughs> that, that stuff just creeps. I mean, it gets it's really yeah. messy. Yeah. So um, just so that next time you know that it. it it comes off okay, but those yeah. bolts should be there. Some of the new pumps don't fit quite like the old pumps do, and you have to. I wondered about that. I kind of wondered if it was warped just a tad, you know, I was pulling it back. So I, after I tightened all the three others, then it was finally snugged in enough, the other one finally gripped onto it. So the rule, you know, maybe it's just warped a tad. I don't know. Um, the and then the other thing was the enough. belt. The belt, too, seemed really, I got it from Moss, and the belt seemed almost too short. I mean, I had to put the you know, the alternate all the way over and it was just okay. like tight, tight, tight on there. That's okay because as as the, um, um, un unlike people who get shorter when, when they get older, belts get longer. And yeah. and um, so, you know, you're constantly, you know, over a period of years, um, you know, constantly pulling the, the generator, I assume you got a generator on your car, but um, yeah, yeah. Pulling that up incrementally, you know, and that's always a question too: is how how tight should that belt be? And if you look in a book or something, it'll say it'll show a little diagram that says half an inch of deflection. Well, I mean, you can always get half an inch of deflection. Just depends on how hard you push. So, how tight should it be? And my my go to number is that it should be tight enough that you cannot turn the generator or alternator pulley in an anti-clockwise direction. I mean, it's always running clockwise. As you're looking at the engine, it always runs clockwise. So the water pump or the generator, or the, the alternator is never gonna run faster th th than the engine. Um, so you only wanna make sure it, it can't run slower than the engine. And so it's, so it's slipping. So as long as you can't turn the, uh, the fan, the front pulley um, on the generator, or the alternator, a hand counterclockwise, anti-clockwise, then you're okay. So. And then I assume they sent me the belt too. The belt was different than the original. The belt, you know, the original one is more of a solid belt. This one had the little bumps in it now. All the, they're all, all the new, all the new belts are, are notched like that. It helps them go, go around the corner better. Some stuff, some stuff gets better, um, you know, and belts, belts have gotten better. Tires have gotten better. Oh my gosh, you hardly ever see anybody off the road anymore with a flat tire. And that's in marked contrast to 50 years ago when there were flat tires everywhere. I know maybe there's more debris in the road. I don't think so. I think tires have gotten a lot better. The rubber's gotten a lot better and, and therefore um, in the belts, it's got better too. So. Yeah. And the last thing, and then I'll let you go, is the putting the radiator back in. It just took me a moment to get that hot. It wouldn't go straight down. I was sitting there trying to get to go straight down. It, uh, you know, you have to put it at an angle, get it to slide down over the little edges there. But it took me a little bit to go, oh, that's what that deal is, yeah. Yeah, well, you just never want to get out a hammer, you know, it's like, <laughs> you know, you gotta nope. got be, got be cautious and, and fit stuff carefully. And I'm, I'm always just, I'm, I'm, an, I'm adamant that you take a bolt and, and, and uh, every single bolt you put in the car and you just, you, you wipe a little grease on it so that the next time it comes off so easily. John Twist, I, I object to the comment of not taking out a hammer because sometimes the only way to get out that coil is with a hammer. Yeah. <laughs> that, was that you? You've told me this twice now. I, have, I still have that coil. That, that was me. Yeah, so Rui couldn't get the coil out off off the inner fender on his MGB. It didn't. He didn't hazard upon the idea that you take the two bolts out of the out of the clamp that holds the coil. 
Um, so he just took a hammer and beat the coil out, out of the out of the housing, out of the bracket, which uh, which works, and gave it to me as an example of what to do, not, what not to do when you're either uh, mad or when you haven't thought it through. And that coil, that I still have that coil, it's out, out in the garage. Um, when you hook that up to a coil tester, the whole case of the coil um, goes hot. I mean, the 18,000 volts. So if you have it on a metal table or if you touch it, not just the end where the spark comes out, but the whole the whole case, yeah, that, that was it. I still have that coil, Rui, just so that you know. But when you're taking things apart, you need a hammer. Sometimes when you put them together, you need a hammer too, but not a radiator. So thanks, Kevin. Thank you very much. Good good luck with your with your uh, A. So so uh, Ot Ot Rinkin, you got some new splined hubs on your MGA. You can unmute yourself. I saw you in there before. Ot. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. They, I was on about a month ago. I had a clunking sound, and you said check the uh, splines and. Uh, I jacked it up and I was able to move move the tire a little bit. I had the emergency brake on, so I put new hubs on the back end and uh, everything seems good now. Although Great. the old ones really didn't look that bad. You know, there's a there's a whole um, there's two ways to inspect splines uh, on on the MGs, and those are the, the splines that they use in the TC all, all the way through 1980. They're the same size splines and i've read stuff you know you look at the you look at the the, the male splines that are on, on the car not the female splines that are, are on the inside of the wheel but you look at those and are they sharp or are they flat and so forth but what we did at the shop is take a pair of, of calipers vernier calipers and just come down on it and measure the outside diameter and the uh, original, the original unworn measurement is 2.450. That's the, that's the diameter of a brand new hub. And over a period of time, it wears and it goes to 440 and then it goes to 430. At 430, it's clunking. 420, it's really clunking. At 390, the, the wheel can come off the car, which I've only ever seen once in 45 years of doing this. I, I've only seen one hub get so bad that, that the wheel came off. So that isn't really an issue. I've seen them come off if you get them on the, on the wrong, wrong side of the car, of course, but um, just where, where, they're, where they're worn out. But I'm glad that that worked out for you. So. Yeah, it's a pleasure driving it now without having that noise. Great, great. Where, where are you from? Uh, Columbia, South Carolina. Uh, two South Carolinas weighing in tonight. Very nice. Okay. All right. Uh, it's a real pleasure. So next one, next guy up here, we got Jim Holiday from London, London, Ontario, but Lon London said, I'm having trouble removing the rear axle um, nut off my twin cam. The moss tool just flares out of shape. Any ideas? Well, we used to see him. Um, Jim, you're, you're, you're still on, aren't you? You can un unmute yourself, Jim Holiday. We got Mike Halliday, but Jim Holiday. So anyway, may maybe you're on here and you're trying to un unmute yourself. We got 148 people on right now. Um, anyway, there was a factory tool for taking the, those octagon nuts off the back of uh, an MG, MGA or MGB. And there's also, it's um, the same factory tool, 18G 2111 or something, had the hex for the other side or for the, um, for the midget. But if the moss tool flares, that's because it isn't built quite well enough, it must be. Of course, those nuts are handed, right? They tighten in the direction of wheel rotation. So if you're taking the, the right-hand nut and trying to turn it clockwise, it ain't gonna turn. You gotta turn it uh, anti-clockwise. So, um, and the, the reverse is true on the left-hand side of the car, the near side. 
um, and that is that the wheel, the nut tightens anti-clockwise, left hand. Um, but if that tool, if that MOS tool flares, then you could probably take the tool to someone with a, with a MIG welder and, have, and, and weld some gussets on the corners so that it, didn't, it doesn't bend out quite as much. You can call Calvin, K-E-L-V-I-N, at Moss and ask him. Um, he may have some ideas since it's their tool, but it's not a size which anything fits. We found a, I don't know, a, a, some factory tool that fit a, I don't know, a DeSoto. No, not a DeSoto, but it was something that was a square. And it was just one sixth, uh, one sixteenth, or one sixty fourth, something or other, too small. And it was a big, it was a big uh, socket. And we we trimmed the inside of the of one face. It was a, a half inch drive tool, and then it was a square, not an octagon, but we could get it on there. So I don't know anyone else who makes that tool. Anybody else know? If if that tool is available some some other place, silent out there. So um, anyway, Jim, I think I, I think the the best thing that you can do is um, uh, try to try to have so, somebody weld something yet on the outside of that so it doesn't distort, so it doesn't bend. That's my, that's the only hint that I I have. You probably ha don't have to do it on all eight sides probably just have to do it on on four sides so. john yes here's 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 the factory tool i think you were talking about okay yeah that's it that's it nice he heavy duty we can't see the wall thickness very well with, with the way that you've got a position but yeah that's a that's a good grief three-eighths of an inch of wall thickness yeah yeah, yeah that, that is the factory tool so what and then we, you run a you run a bar through here right to get your leverage to open it. So what's the what's the part number on that, Tony? 18G152, and I can't read the last number, torn um, off. Well, okay. Anyway, so 18G2111 was only a little bit right. So okay. Thank you. Thank yep. you. So to, Tony's got one for uh well, you can't come down and get it. The border is still closed. Maybe. I think I just saw the 21st of January, maybe the border between the U.S. and Canada will open up. And of course, that too depends. So anyway, we have LSMC1. LSMC1. You can, you can unmute yourself, LSMC1. That's, that's how I've got you labeled. Hi, hi John. It's Mike. How okay. Okay, Mike. All right. right. I'm looking. Okay. Gotcha. Mike. So Mike says, I've got an overdrive gearbox that I'd like to put in my 74B. And I read on Facebook, it was necessary to change uh, the, the gear ratio in the rear end, which really surprised me. I hope this isn't necessary. So from what year is your overdrive gearbox? Do you know? Uh, no, I don't know the exact year. I know it's a black label. Uh, box. Is, it, is it a side fill or a top fill? Does it, you put the oil in the side or do you put it in, in the top through the dipstick? You know, that, I don't know. That's the separation in the gearboxes. So I don't know. There's it's also a blue label and red label and, and there's- I, I, I think it's a black label. Okay. Um, and I'm, I'm, I, I always go by how, how, how they fill. So the black I, label I, I, is- I could is look- The newer one or the older one? It's- <laughs> I could look at Eric in the garage. Eric, Eric's trying to, to uh, get, get in here, but Eric, you sound like the chipmunks. So I, 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 I'm sorry. I, I have to, I have to mute you, Eric, because it, it, you sound like a chipmunk. Too bad. Um, any, anyway, here's the scoop. Okay. Um, there are two, two different speedos. In, and in 74, there are two different speedos. Um, but they're two different speedos, and it's it, the number is located down around five o'clock on the speedo face, and it either says twelve eighty, which is chrome bumper cars, or it says one thousand, which is rubber bumper cars. That's the difference. 
So the, the overdrive is designed to drive one of those two speedos. Now you can get another speedo. You can, you can buy another speedo and put it in the car so it doesn't make any difference what this gearbox is that you got. Um, you can put it in and if it reads wrong by about a quarter, I mean, you know immediately that it's reading wrong, then you gotta get the other speedo. But if the speedo is a top fill, in other words, you have to put the oil in through the dipstick hole, then it's the 1280, the earlier one. And then someone got the bright idea, oh my gosh, let's put a side fill on this so that you don't have to dribble oil all, all over the, the, uh, the right hand um, footwell. Um, and so they put a side fill in there and all those are thousand are clocked at a thousand turns per mile. So that doesn't mean even the filler, even the color uh, on, the, on the solenoid doesn't necessarily mean that the speedo drive in the back is correct, but it's an indicator. But here is a really good idea. It, take the take the speedo drive out of the overdrive and look in there with a bright light. Maybe not from your phone because you get so much light flashing back in your face, but look in there and just make sure that the gear, the driving gear looks good. Because if, it, if it's bad, you got to take, uh, it, it won't work. And you got to take the whole overdrive back out. So just before you put it in, just look in there. If the, if the gears are, are white, generally, that means they're 1280 gears. If the gears are red, generally, that means they're 1000 gears. So that's all. You just have to match the speedo to the overdrive. Okay, so, so, so um, again, the thread said that it was necessary to change the rear end ratio. And I've never heard, I no. don't no. no. No, no, right? No, right? No. No. Okay. That's, that didn't make any sense to me. I saw it and I said, oh, I got I, I can't wait to get on the thread. And um, so that's good. I can't imagine MG, um, you know, making the cars ratio on the rear end for overdrive. And um, my also assumption is that I can use my current drive shaft. You with, can. Okay. Okay. You can do, do that too. So the only thing... The only thing, uh, well, you know, I mean, it's like, how far do you want to go? But making sure that the, the speedo gear is correct, that's really nice. And the other thing you want to make sure is that the third, fourth lockout switch or fourth gear lockout switch, depending on what year the gearbox came from, is working because that's the least accessible electrical component in the car. And oh my gosh, what a project it is to change it afterwards. So, I'm, I've got some background noise here, so um, uh, I'm trying really hard to, there we go, Steve, I don't know who Steve is, but there's some noise in the back of that. So um, anyway, so th those, those are the two things, to make sure that the lockout switch works correctly um, and that the, the gears are okay. I mean, you can take the whole thing apart and rebuild the whole unit, although almost always they work just fine. And if they don't, almost always you can, you can repair it from underneath, so. Right, okay, so thank tomorrow, you. Tom. If you want, tomorrow, um, send me a picture of, of that gearbox um, and uh, or a couple of shots and, and I'll, I'll give you some better advice about how to wire it and make sure that it, it's oh, in place. That would be phenomenal. I really appreciate that. I will do that. Thank okay. you. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you kindly. You're welcome. Okay. Yeah. Nice talking to you. Pleasure. Where, where are you from? I'm, I'm, I'm outside of, uh, I'm, I'm near uh, Baltimore, Maryland. Okay. All right. So we've got East coast, yes, East coast sir. stuff. Yeah. We're going to get some snow tomorrow. That's, that's what they say. You ought to be a weatherman in Michigan. It's the only mm -hmm. job you can have and be wrong half the time and so keep, keep your job. There you so, go. So, okay, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Thank you. All right, Albert, Albert Barr, who's asking about silicon brake fluid. Albert, you can unmute yourself if you'd like. Hi, John, here I am. Okay, there, there we go. So 
What year and model do you have? Uh, 78. It's um, everything's new. Haven't put any fluid in anything yet. Okay. Is the uh, is the underbonnet like so so beautiful that you you could have lunch in there? Uh, I I just took it off a of rotisserie, so it, it's all new. Everything's new. Then you so, then use silicone fluid. Okay. Um, silicone fluid. It, the the single advantage to silicone fluid is it doesn't eat paint. I mean that's that's it. Oh. Um, so it, you know, and it doesn't matter how careful you are. You know, you start to bleed it, and all of a sudden you discover you got a brake line that's loose. You just didn't even yep. know. So you get some dribble down there, and you wipe it off. And two days later, there's little bubbles there. It's so frustrating. Yeah. Well, I'm looking for the long haul, not to have to change brake fluid very often. So. Well, you still have to bleed it. You still have to bleed it. Oh, uh, yeah, that's not an issue, but yeah. Um, so, um, but with silicone fluid. You've got to you've got to introduce it into the system and bleed it very very slowly and carefully because it aerates so easily and it may be that after you're halfway you know you've got the thing bled out and you're you're not getting any more bubbles on 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 any of the four corners or at the clutch but stuff still doesn't feel right wait wait another day and wait for all those bu bubbles to come up and then and then uh, bleed it really slowly. So I'm talking about moving the brake pedal down over a period of you know two seconds or so forth. Open the bleeder, depress the pedal, close the bleeder, let up on the pedal, wait. Open the bleeder, depress. But don't don't do one of these. Oh, you can't see it, but don't yeah. you know, have somebody inside who's jumping up, up and down on the on the pedal because yeah. it'll yeah. just froth up. And you just you have to start bleeding it later. So. Any advantage to vacuum bleeding them? You can make a case for that. Sure, sure. If you got a, a mighty vac, yeah. And um, the problem is when you undo the undo the um, the bleeder, of course, then air comes around the bleeder, and so you're gonna you're gonna work your hand. <laughs> to death, yeah. you know, because <laughs> half, half of the half of the suction that you're getting is just slipping around the the uh, the side there. But um, um, so I just got a, a whole bunch of texts, and I I get emails all the time. I just had to look off to the side there. I'm sorry. That's right. Yeah. Um, no, I haven't used it before, uh, silicone brake fluid. I've got the, the silicone brake fluid, but before I put it in, I just wanted to get your opinion. Yeah, um, it'll be okay. In a, on a 78B, it's great. When you use it on a T-type or an MGA, there can be problems with a brake or the clutch coming on by themselves, but that doesn't seem to occur in our cars, in the, in the later cars. Okay. Um, and, but you still annually, annually, you want to bleed the brakes. Just, just couple of pumps on each corner just to blow the old fluid out because water still does get in the system. You know, who knows how, I don't know, yeah. you know, through the steel lines, well, you wouldn't think so through the rubber lines, you wouldn't yeah. think so, but water gets in there somehow. So, um, in the water will not, um, combine with the fluid. So it sits very distinctly in the rusts yeah. as it, as it sits. So, okay. Yeah. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Where, where, where are you from? Did I ask you? I didn't. Um, um, Indianapolis. Indianapolis. Oh, Bob yep. Connell territory. Okay. Yep. 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 I just talked to him the other day. He, yeah, yep. Okay, yeah. so um, Jason Benham, um, you got my thoughts on that as well about the, about the uh, fluid. So, all right, so I've got TFM with a 79 midget. So TFM, if you're on, you can unmute yourself and come on and we'll talk for a little bit about your 79 midget with 10,000 miles. Yep. Hey, John. It's uh, first name Tom. Tom. Okay. So whereabouts in Wisconsin are you? Well, I'm actually in Royal Oak, Michigan. Oh, all right. Okay. So I bought this thing sight unseen. Um, I had an inspector inspect the car for me. And then I bought it based on his inspection, and I was uh, pretty disappointed when I finally got it. And the whole friggin' under hood area was just 
mouse nests and remnants of mice nests. They were in the heater. They were under the master. It was everywhere. Everywhere. And it still is everywhere. You haven't got it all unless you've taken the heater motor out of the car. I've taken let, all of that out. You've taken the door panels off and the interior panels out? I've not got to the interior. I've literally spent the last year in my spare time doing under hood. Okay. And it looks beautiful now. Okay. Yeah, you know, I re I repainted it. I repainted all the components. It's I mean I took everything except I didn't take the engine physically out, but I took everything around the engine out. Okay. All right. And yeah, yeah. There's no there's nothing like nothing like mice. So, and, and, you know, I've seen no evidence of them inside the car, no, oh, drugs, well, that, no damage. The, the, uh, the underbonnet was just the lobby. Yeah. Um, they, 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 had, they had rooms set up. I, um, my, my, uh, my daughter um, bought a 73 BGT that had been off the road since, I don't know, 84, something or other, out, out of Wisconsin. And um, sight unseen. And we knew what we were getting because the guy sent us about 10,000 pictures. Um, and um, I was stunned. I didn't see any mouse stuff at all. Then we started taking the interior panels out. And I said, oh, here's, here's where they've been. So, um, all right, so I got that to look forward to then. So let me, let me just suggest um, that engine uh, has some particular faults to it. And before you spin it up and, and start it and start driving, my suggestion, a long way away from mice here, is to drop the sump, comes right off real easy and get right to it, um, pull, pull that down and replace all the rod bearings and the main bearings and the thrust washers and the oil pump. Okay. Just do it, just do it. It's 150 bucks worth of parts. You get to lie in your back. It isn't hard. It isn't hard duty. Um, and um, I, I've got, you know, you can contact me later. I, I can tell you some more information about what to do. But the uh, that's a that's a Triumph Spitfire engine. Yep. And uh, the main bearings and rod bearings are very very narrow. Uh, and there's a lot of problem with the thrust. And after being stored for that long, God knows they didn't store it correctly. Yep. If they had. They would have put. Of course, the mothballs might have sublimed by now, but they probably stored it with the old oil, and old oil is acidic, and it'll eat the bearings up. So it just it's just you know something that you should do as a preventive measure before you get it back on the road. Okay. All right. Great. I will. I will do that. Okay. I'll do that in the spring. I'm not doing it now. It's too cold. Okay. <laughs> right. Tom, th thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for being here. Thanks for being in Michigan. Geez. So. Oh my gosh. Thank you for having these sessions. These are great. Hey, thank you. All right, Ned Matura, whose foot has healed. Ned, where are you? You can un unmute yourself. Hey, and Jeff. Here we go. All right, Ned. Hey. How you okay. Doing? Uh, I have an I have an MGB with overdrive. Uh, needs rockers redone. Um, body super straight. Doors close easily. A light push and they should close close by themselves. Um, should I get this done before anything else? And you're talking about doing the sills on the car, right? That's right. Well, uh, yeah. I mean, if if they're shot, you can take off um, the the. There's a couple of different ways to to do the sills. One is to cut the bottom of the front fender off at the chrome strip from the center of the wheel arch in front, just clean it all, all the way back to, to the door. And then you cut off the bottom of the rear fender up about four inches. You don't start cutting before you've got the replacement body panels and see how, how they're gonna go on. That then exposes the sill. And you can go ahead and do whatever work you have to with the sill or the frame or the castle section. There's an embossed piece that goes in there, who knows? Just because you buy a whole new sill or a whole new castle section doesn't mean you have to install the whole thing. You can install just part of it, uh, you know, cut it off where the where the rust ends and weld the pieces in. Everything is everything. The whole fit of the car 
is predicated on the position of the door. So don't take the door off. <laughs> don't take the door off. And even, even when you cut that sill out of there, that door will still open and close just easily. It's absolutely amazing how much strength there is in the body, mostly because of that, all that oil that's washed on the floor pan and the, and the tunnel and so forth. But yeah, I, I, uh, I do the sill. That's the, that's the biggest part that you have to do. And depending on the color of the car and what you want in the end, you can just paint underneath the chrome strip. You can go from the center of the front wheel arch because it is a millimeter away from the chrome strip and you can't see the color change and then paint it all the way to the back of the car, um, uh, back to the, uh, to the tail light. We used to do a, a lot of that. Um, so, but I, I, Sounds would, good. I, I would do that. And then the question is, you know, do you hire someone to do it? who's never done it before, doesn't know what they're doing, but they know how to weld, you trust them, or is it time for you to get a cutoff wheel and you know, spend some money on a MIG welder and experiment and do some of it yourself? You know, that's, the, that's that restoration question. You know? do, you, do you think that's possible for someone who hasn't welded before? I, you know, I, I'm, I'm not a great photographer, you know, so, um, I, you know, it's, it's, uh, everyone's got their own skill set and, and you can learn. Carl Heidemann at Eclectic, not, e, e, not electric, Eclectic Motor Works in Holland, Michigan, used to have, maybe still does have welding seminars and they're all over. You can go to them and Carl's got like, you know, four or five rules after that, it's, it's, um, it's just practice. Uh, his rules are real simple, like uh, you got to see what you're doing. Uh, you can't weld rust. You can't weld air. You can't weld dirt. You got to be in a good mood. You got to be comfortable. It's just really, really simple stuff. And then you start to weld. There's, there's some stuff to it, but he's got some weekend seminars or used to have them. Um, and uh, you, you can go to one of those, come back to Western Michigan in the middle of the winter. And, and learn um, learn how to weld, you know, learn learn welding, or you can go online and watch a thousand YouTube videos too. I mean, it's just doing, it's just doing. It's ninety five percent uh, inspiration, uh, or excuse me, five percent inspiration and ninety five percent perspiration. I'm willing to I'm willing to do that. Uh, Carl used to work at your shop, right? He did, but that was a yeah. long time ago. That was a, that was back when he was uh, in college, and now he's. He's got kids who are out of out of college, so was he's he, at his shop. He works at Hope College. In was he the around ninety seven, ninety eight? Was he around your shop ninety seven? He was. He probably was around the shop. Okay. Um, because we did a lot of seminars to, together yeah. and stuff. But yeah, he's had his own shop in Holland for great. Eight, certainly during, during that that time. So eclectic motor works. Holland, Thank you. Michigan. Thanks so much, John. Okay. I appreciate yeah, it. Real John. Hey, John. John, can I just? Yeah, uh, Rob. You, wait a second. Um, but Ned, you're from Syracuse. Where, where, where are you from? I'm uh, from Vancouver. Oh, I'm from okay. Vancouver, BC. Okay. Um, just about welding. I replaced uh, both or MGB GT, and one of the main things you should do. Yeah, I did keep the doors on. Is make sure the car is perfectly level before you cut that out. Because mine had, the, the sill set rusted so long ago that the card actually bent in the center a little bit. And okay. so when I made sure the car was absolutely level, then I had that nice little eight inch space all around the door and the, the actual sill had bent under, un, under the pressure of being so rusted. Okay, we... We lost, we lost you there, but I got the point. So thank you. Thank you very much. Must be part of that Google thing. Ned, where, where are you from? Syracuse or where? I'm from New York City. New York City. Oh my gosh. Yeah. One, one double O, O something. Yeah. One eight. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. Ned, thank you very, very much. If and I interject no, quick. I'm sorry. Say again. If I can interject quick, I, yes. uh, to Ned, I, I bought a welder. I went to the local high school and took a little welding class 
and so far I've uh, put floors in my midget and right now I'm working on putting rockers in my B. You can do it. Great. Thanks so much, Greg. I appreciate it. Yep. Thanks a lot, Greg. Okay, now we're from uh, we're on to Harry Mac. No, Harry, who's got a Mac computer. Not Harry Mac, probably. So anyway, Harry, who's who's on a Mac computer, um, who's asking about steering. But I think this is probably a comment. I think Harry is making a comment to to check steering for wear and make sure your components are greased and lubed prior to driving. And that was probably in response to someone who's had their car off for a long time. We had at the shop, we had a, a, a um, service that we called a complete lubrication. We used to say it was 99 things. I never counted them. They're certainly not 99. It took the better part of all day. I've mentioned this here before. And when you're running at the shop at 100 bucks an hour and it takes six hours to do, there's 600 bucks, plus some oils and filters and some stuff that you always know goes bad anyway, you could, you could chew up a thousand bucks. And I suggested this to anyone whose car had been in storage for any length of time, anyone who just purchased an MG, because everything got done at once. And that complete lubrication is on my website under, I don't know, forms or resources or something on that top ribbon where the, where the um, um, add your name to the, to the newsletter button is too, which doesn't work. My daughter's working on that tonight. Maybe by tomorrow, that'll be up and going. That's also where my PayPal button is. I haven't said anything about that in a while. I've got to say something about that. Thank you, thank you for um, making donations and helping me out. It, it, I appreciate it very, very much. Um, and I, I keep saying I will have a list of, of donors because, and I remember lots of names, but I don't wanna start naming them because I'll forget people and I wanna be able to, to put it up and thank everybody. And I will do that. It has been a while. People have been contributing uh, for a long time, but since these seminars began, and I've never given a true and exact accounting. I won't give an accounting. I'll, I will give a true and exact list of, of everyone who's donated. So thank you very kindly. Whether you do it on PayPal or whether um, I've got two or three people who have sent me checks in the mail, and those people get back a nice note back from me because mail's the mail, you know. But anyway, anyway, I'm off on a tangent. Okay, so now we have Glenn. And Glenn says, how do you get rid of the bachelor lean on an MGB? I don't know if I've heard it called that before, but um, in this country, in the United States, um, when you're only got a single driver, eventually the left rear leaf spring fails or begins to fail, begins to sag. The car pivots from left front to right rear so the right front of the car rises. So as the, as the left rear sags, the right front rises. So if you wanna be really inexpensive about it, you swap the rear springs and back, right? And then the right side will probably be in about the same place the left side is when you're sitting in it. Most people wouldn't choose to do that they choose to replace the springs. But there's a cautionary about replacing the springs because I don't know, I, I don't know I, if all springs that you've purchased today are excellent quality or not. I know in the past there've been some issues to say the least. Um, and we always had our leaf springs rebuilt. I just, I just, I've just had a set, I'm gonna pick them up in the morning. Re rebuilt by a local spring shop, but they've been doing them for 30 years. And when I dropped them off, I don't know if the guy doing them had COVID or he, he was a drying out in a, you know, a, a, at the hospital from being an alcoholic or why, I have no idea why he wasn't there, but he wasn't there for like two weeks. And that when I dropped the springs off, they said, there's only one guy that knows how to do this and he's out sick right now. 
So I had to wait for him to come back, which he did, and then my springs are done. So it may be that when you take your springs to your local spring shop, they'll just throw up their hands and go, I, you know, I don't know how stiff it's supposed to be. Well, here's what I've done. Here's what I've done so far. I have uh, replaced all four springs, including front springs, and um, still had a lean. It didn't really change anything. And uh, that kind of perplexed me. No kidding. Um, and uh, somebody said, and this is the scariest thing, sometimes your car, if it's been driven like that a long time, will just take a set that way. And other people have said, no way, because the body's too stiff. That body is so rigid. There's something going on. So you take a tape measure and you measure from the ground to the bottom of the chrome strip on all four corners. I've done that. Yeah. Right now I've got it to, well, here's what I did. Finally, I just so, threw up my so, hands. So when, when it's unladen, unladen, you're not in it. How, how close are, how close are all those measurements within half an inch? Three quarters of an inch. That's, that's on the back end. So, side yeah, side. On the, yeah. The back end and then the front uh, right is probably about a half inch too high. Okay. So, um, I'm okay. So there's still, there's something wrong. Do you put, put in new springs or do you put in re rebuilt springs? I just got four springs from Moss. Okay. So it might be that you can swap those springs in the back end, left and right. What a hassle. I know, but I, we're looking for a solution here. Um, it could be that you, uh, to sit, sit in the right hand side and see how much that side collapses then sit in the left-hand side and see how much that side collapses mm -hmm. or get some, somebody that's, uh, you, you know, 150 pounds or more um, to, to sit in there and see if the spring sags more on the left than on the right. If it sags more sitting in it, then you got to get some more springs. The, those, okay. the, some, they're not evenly, um, uh, the, 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 um, the flex on them isn't the same. When, when the words, when I'm looking for a word here, but the, the um, torsion's the wrong word. Anyway, um, contour. Are, what's that? Contour. Yeah, contour works. Anyway, they, um, they should flex the same. So there's still something wrong with the spring. It's not the frame of the car. Well, what I just did the last weekend was I went out and bought at AutoZone a helper spring. Actually, I bought a pair of them, but I only put the one on the left okay. just to just as a sort of a stopgap measure. Sure. Now it's within a quarter of an inch. The right front is just fine. Yeah. Uh, now, somebody just put up the message that maybe my uh, sway bar is bent. Um, I, I, you know, I, I don't I know don't, how much. What, what year is your car? 70. Uh, the, there's no sway bar in the back. So, um, ah, okay. So that, that's not the issue. So, all right. So okay. anyway, it's a, it's a, there's a problem with this and, and it goes back to what, what I said. There's, there's been a problem with the quality of the spring supply. There has been, I don't know if there still is. So, okay. Well, ultimately I'd like to remove that helper spring, but I think the next uh, thing I'm going to do is just swap the springs. Yeah. You know, the that's it. That's it. There's always, <laughs> there's always a dollar solution. You know, there, there, there's always a, an inexpensive way out. So we're, where are you, Glenn? Uh, Southern California. I'm Orange County. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. Irv well, Irvine specifically. Okay. All right. Well, hey, good luck. So you can you can drive those you can drive those springs right right back up to uh, Santa Barbara. So yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks a bunch. All right. Okay. So anyway, we've got now we have um, Peter who's logged in and said quality of parts and availability would cause me not to do an in-depth resto on a car today. The project would not bother me as much as the quality of the parts. So this is probably for my initial thing. And, and um, you can make a case on, on that. It's really easy to see uh, when you go to a car show who's, whose car's got all new parts in it because they don't look the same as the original parts. So they look just fine the way they are. But if, if you're gonna take a look at the two cars next to each other, you say, well, this is shinier, this 
this, geez, this thing's off by an eighth of an inch or something. Um, and then there's also the quality of working parts, but most of the working parts are safe. Things like steering and brakes, the most important parts of the car, um, nobody fools around with, with those. They, they don't, that's too creepy to, uh, to have, have that kind of stuff out in the marketplace that's not working. So it's just the trim stuff, you know? So anyway, my standard line is that any part, any original part rebuilt is better than a new part. Now that's not an absolute, of course, but close. I mean, what are you gonna do with, with a gas tank? You can't rebuild a gas tank. You gotta buy a new one. And the gas tanks are great right now. Um, there've been, uh, yeah, every now and then there's a bad one. We had one, we bought a gas tank one time and it, it would only take down, it'd take about the top, I don't know, gallon, gallon and a half. And then it starts sucking air because the, the steel line that went inside the tank was perforated. So as long as it was covered with gasoline, it, it worked just fine, but it got below that and the tank would a lot rather suck air than gas. So even though there was still 10 gallons worth of gas, 10 gallons of gas in the tank, it couldn't get it out of there. There's, there's all kinds of surprises. So we've got Rob Tedrow. Rob Tedrow can come on. Can you hear me, John? Yeah, yep, yep. I don't see you, but you're on. And Rob's asking if anyone has a modern paint coat code for a British racing green for an MGB. There's got to be some stuff out there that's pretty modern, but most cars right now are black and white, aren't they, off the, off the lot? <laughs> John, uh, this is Judd. I don't know if you can see the MGB oh, yeah. behind mine. Uh, my previous owner, uh, retired Navy Admiral, uh, rebuilt that car and swears to me that that is the only actually British racing green that MG ever called British racing green. And I've got all of his work materials. He's no longer with us, sadly. I've got all his uh, uh, rebuild notes. I haven't gone through them thoroughly, but I'd be glad to go through them after this and see if I can find the paint code he used. I would email it sure. to you and then Rob could yeah, I, I get, get in to touch Rob. with you. Uh, sure. That's a now, to me, it's a little bit yellow or green that I think of British racing green. My TD is a nice dark, what you might call a forest green, and I've always thought of that as British racing green. So, and then the other thing I understand is the British racing green was just because when they were doing international racing, Ferraris were red and Mercedes were white and English cars were green and French cars were blue. So any green is British racing green. You you are correct. The um, saying British racing green is like saying tree. You know, it's like what <laughs> maple and oak, elm. You know? um, so and and even with NMG in, in in seventy or seventy one, there were two two greens: new racing green, which is really yellowy, and and uh, the other one they called. Um, uh, Anyway, there's a, there's a Brooklyn, chart. In Brooklyn. the Brooklyn's is the new one. That's the, that's like 77 through 80. My late wife, Caroline, did all the, you know, did that chart that's in the Moss Motors catalog. Um, it, but, and, and uh, Clausiger in his book expanded on that list and included ICI codes. But the problem is that the paints that are made today there's just, there's no, there's no way to convert them. Right, they don't um, have lead. Well, I, there's just no way to, to, to convert the color. So um, the best you can do is, you know, I, when people would bring a car to us and say, I want it restored. And I'd say, well, what color do you want it? Well, I want it original. Okay. Or they'd say, well, I want it, you know, I, I'm not sure. And I say, go out on a car lot. Go out on the car lot and, and find the color you want and then get that because if you've got a 2020 color on your car, you can go to Nap and buy a, a can, you know, some duplicolor can for, for touch up. I mean, it's everybody can paint it. It's really easy. Um, Paul Deershaw, 
I use his name a lot um, at Sports Car Craftsman in Denver, Colorado, actually in Arvada, but uh, Sports Car Craftsman. He has a collection of the front wheel splash panels from every color MGB. I don't think he's got Bermuda blue, but um, he's, he's got, he's got to have 60 of them hanging there if they're that many colors. And they're really true, true blue colors. Um, you know, the backs of the front side of the, that splash panel always gets covered with tar and stones and chips and road debris. But the back side is hidden and, and, and he's gleaned these from all these different cars. And he still has those, those original type colors, but, but still the question is, how do, you, how do you find it? So I don't know, what, if you put that out on MG Experience and, and ask people. I've read that. I've also gone out to the Jaguar site and I've got some good leads on the Jaguar, quote, British Racing Green. Well, it, it, British Racing Green is whatever color you want it to be. Right. So choose, choose the color you want. Going back to restoration, we got a car in one time. It was painted Old English White, MGA. Uh, I think it was probably a 62. And uh, we started stripping it down. It turned out that it was Alamo Beige underneath. So I called the owner and I said, turns out, your car is Elmo Beige. And he goes, well, if that's the color it was originally, then let's paint it that color. And I said, have you ever seen Alamo Beige? He goes, well, no, not really. So we painted up a panel that was a foot by a foot. You know, if you're an interior decorator, you can use something the size of a postage stamp, but we'd paint up these big panels. And I UPSed it to him and he called me two days later when he got the panel and he said, paint it white. <laughs> Alamo Beige is is either you like it or you don't. Most people don't. It wasn't a very popular color, but just go out, just go out and find a color. Unless you're adamant that it's got to be the factory color, then you've got a lot of... Uh, it doesn't have to be a factory co color, John. Just wanted to know if somebody's done it recently and they had a paint code to make it easy yeah. to, to then go to the paint shop and say, hey, let me see what this code looks like or give yeah. me a pint and I'll go spray it and see if I like it. Yeah. That, that was the uh, kind of the basis. Okay. All right. A quick quick question on an early MGB that has a uh, Jaeger fuel gauge. My my car has a generator and it's positive ground and I was going to convert it to negative. And recently I've been reading a lot of people have trouble with fuel gauges by not grounding the cases properly or not getting the power feeds into them. These are the, the early ones that don't have voltage stabilizers or anything. It, it's just a voltmeter. It's stupid. It matter. It'll work Perfect. one way or the other. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Okie doke. Rob, All right. pl pleasure. Where's Rob from? North Canton, Ohio, just north of Canton, home of the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Here. Oh, here's a good one from Mike Grogan. Uh, he said the frame up in Arizona, uh, in Phoenix, from the frame up has the seal for the speedo cable drive thing. So that, um, so I didn't even think about that. That's, that's a real good, they've got, he's got a real good operation there. It's strictly TC. I say that and, and thinking at the same time, he's probably got some other stuff out there. Some TC stuff fits TDs and lots of TD stuff fits 1980 MGBs. There's a nice evolution, but there's quite a break between um, between the TC and the and the and the TD. So anyway, from the frame up, it's a nice source for all all T type parts. Okay, so um, Mel Goldberg has got a note here, and. Um, he says that over the past 40 years, he's tuned his MGA with, with uh, 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 the conventional way and once with a color tune. Um, he says it seemed to make sense looking at the, at the color of the, of the fire inside of the cylinder. And so he's, he's asking if you're still on here, Mel, we still got 143 people. We're running at... Uh, at uh, quarter after eight. So Mel, are you on here? 
Yeah, I so, certainly am. Okay, all right. So, so um, you've tuned your car the conventional way, but you've used the, the Gunson color tune a couple of times yeah. or something? Yeah, it just seemed like, you know, you look down the, I'm getting some feedback here. Uh, you look down the, uh, you know, the, the, there's like a glass ring around the sure. plug that you're looking into the, into the cylinder. And uh, you, by, the, by the color of the spark, uh, you can tell if your mixture is correct. That is correct. The, prob the only problem using the color tune as it's, as it's put in the package is that they want you to get a blue flame. And you can't. It has to, it has to be orangey red. So the thing to do is tune up your car so that the conventional way, so that when you lift the air piston, the RPM changes by 50 RPM. You get that little tiny, tiny rise, and then put the guns and color tune in there and look at it and go, oh, that's the color that I'm supposed to get. From there on out, you can use the guns and color tune. But their chart shows you from lean to rich. And they're, they're looking for a, a blue flame like you'd see on your stove. And that's just way, way, way too lean. So. So other, other than that, you can use the, the color tune. It's kind of gimmicky. I, I, don't, I, I don't know anybody in the trade that uses it. I say that, but I, I don't, maybe some people do. Um, almost always, if you just disturb the position of the air piston, you can tell instantly whether it's running correctly or not. Okay, that makes perfect sense because uh, uh, without, without doing it the way you're suggesting it, it is running blue, uh, it was blue. And uh, it did seem like it is running lean. At least it's a little bit tough starting the car and, and all those sorts of things where it used to be just a, I'd turn the key and, and pull a starter uh, and it would just immediately fire up. So uh, that makes perfect sense. Well, the choke, you should always have to use the choke, even if you're in Southern California to start the car, just to start it, that's all. And then, and then immediately relax it all the way. But you should have to use the, the choke to start it. If you don't have to use the choke, it's probably adjusted too rich. Where, where are you calling from? Uh, Northern California, oh, Sonoma oh, County. Okay, well, we're in California, but um, okay. So it, 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 how, how warm is it when, when you're starting it like that without a choke? Well, typically I do start it with a choke and then I let it run for a okay. while to the point where I don't need the choke and that's when I start uh, the, okay. the color tune. All right, yeah, okay, okay. So, yeah, I, I sort of, I sort of, um, yeah, I just like having a stove that, that, you know, you've used a stove for all these years and it doesn't have a, it doesn't have a window on the door and, and then you get a, you buy a new stove and there's a window on the, on the front. You can actually look inside and see stuff cooking and, um, um, it, you just got to be careful that, that you don't change the way that you really do things to accommodate somebody that's telling you to look for something that you're not going to get and that you're, you're not going to get a, a, a blue flame in, in your guns. And so anyway, well, thanks. Thanks a lot, John. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right, Ned, Ned. Um, Ned's weighed in here about an overdrive. I've got another MGB with overdrive, an 80. Oh, wait, Ned, you, you've already got, yep. You, we've yep. Already, yep Sorry, we've already John. Done that. That's okay. You answered that already. Right. So Thank from, you. from Christian, uh, looking for a knowledgeable mechanic that specializes in a 1933 J2, supercharged J2. So California guys, I let's see the first place to look. There's a British Motor Trade Association, and they have a list of I don't know hundreds of of people that work on British cars, and so that's BMTA. If you go on the web, it's uh, Brit Car B R I T C A R Britcar dot org, and you can look for somebody. And then uh, Barney Gaylord on his site, mgaguru.com, has a list of jillions of shops, although half of them have got a horizontal line through them because so many have 
have closed up since he started keeping track. I don't know anyone who knows about supercharged J2s in California, but I'm sure there's someone. Um, Tom Langa, L-A-N-G-E, uh, who runs Half Moon Farm in Maine, uh, does, does T-type work, although it's T-type, it's not pre-war work. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm Christian, I, I'm clueless. I, I don't know, is it, anybody on, on here who's from California that, who can give a, a suggestion? It's silent out there, so. Anyway, um, if someone thinks of someone in California who knows about pre-war MGs, oh, um, um, safety fast restorations. Um, that's the, the triple M register. That's, that's where to go to, go to f find out. Um, maybe you can end up tuning it yourself if you get enough information. So the triple M register, the midgets, magnets, and magnets. Um, this is a midget. Um, that would be the that that would be the place to to go to. So, Christian, if you're still on, you can contact me later. I think I know who you are, so I contact you later too. Okay, so we're on to our next one here, which is um, iPad two to everybody. Do the doors and windshield from a seventy. MGB GT fit a 1965 MGB GT. I expect I expect this is the same question, and I would say yes that the doors on a 70 BGT fit, fit back and forth between uh, a 70 and a 65. It's going to change. The interior door handle is going to change, uh, but I, I'd say the 70 door may still be punched out for the for the other handles. The windshield is absolutely the same, um, and I think maybe the I think maybe the the doors are too. You could go with either either type of, of door opener. They this is well beyond the pull handle, so so that's the question there. But we don't find out we don't get to find out who iPad two is because he's not self identifying. So our next one up here is from Paul Evans. So Paul, if you are I'm right here, I see you there. Okay, your thoughts on which it says peening on here, but that looks like a uh, a typo. No, it's, uh, well, I, it, shot peening is kind of old, but uh, oh, all right, okay. Well, we we'll see. Paint. We'll remove the if paint. you want to take the paint off the car. Yeah. If you use a chemical stripper, you can never get it all off, and there's always some caught inside, underneath, someplace yeah. or other, that after you put on a $10,000 paint job, wicks out and ruins the paint, so that's frustrating. If you, if you have the car media blasted, yeah. uh, you cannot have a single thing which moves which means you got to have the suspension off the car. You've got to have it apart. Um, sandblasting uh, or, or um, glass, glass blasting, it's the same thing, but there is soda blasting. Well, that's, yeah, that's, that's what, I, uh, in fact, iPad 2 on a private message said that, that's what he recommended. And that's, um, that's one of the choices that I have available to me. Yeah. Uh, it's That's a, it, if you don't want to take the car all the way apart, no. because it just doesn't matter how well you mask something, sand's going to get in there, and sand is just wreaks havoc with bearings and brakes and engines and gearboxes, yeah. differentials. It's just awful. Um, uh, even even if you strip the car all the way down, all the way down, you get everything off it, and you go have it sandblasted. And then you get it back and you put it on a rotisserie and you turn it upside down and right side up and you use air compressed air and you use a vacuum cleaner 
and everything you get, you get all the sand. I mean, absolutely all the sand is out of there. You build the whole car, you drive it the first time, you stop, and there's little pillars of sand underneath the car where it's sifted out and gone someplace. It's just sand is just a real, but soda is better. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's uh, that's uh, that's what I'm uh, I'm le uh, obviously leaning toward that because I'm just trying to get as much uh, information up front as possible because once I get it, the soda blasting done. I've got uh, what maybe a couple of days before it needs to be primed at the most, um, so I have to go from the blasting to the paint shop, have that all scheduled so it's ready to go. Flat bed it from the blaster to the paint shop, they can prime it and get ready to paint. So it's uh, it, if you can see it behind me, it's a it's a 58 ZB um, Mega ZB. Well, it's oh. an MGA, yeah, it's, it's an MGA, but <laughs> that's just what drives it. You know? So okay, yeah, yeah. very so, cool. All right. Yeah, I so appreciate it. Thank you. Paul, where, where, where are you, Paul? Uh, Newport Beach, California. Oh, all right. Well, gosh, the advantage of the cars out there is you don't get much rust. Well, this is, I bought this uh, uh, from a long story made real short. It's an Arizona car, originally licensed in Arizona, originally sent to Arizona. So it's, there's no, I had some surface rust in the, you know, floors and things like that. Just really minor stuff. But there's no hole. There are no holes in it. You open up the trunk, and it's just as solid as can be. Where the spare tire was, so uh, just uh, so it, that's why I bought it because it was such a solid car. Frame rails are straight, body straight. So uh, you know, best fifteen hundred dollars so, I spent. So. so talk to your paint shop first. Was, was ever going to paint it and say, look, do you even want me to strip this, or are you guys going to strip it? Yeah, yeah. It may be that all they want to do is DA the fenders. And the doors and the top and so forth, and um, let the rest of it go. I yeah. mean, I you know, I mean, hey, you know, so yeah, appreciate it. Okay. okay, thanks a lot, Paul. Thank you. Okay, so Chuck Linick, Chuck Linick is weighed in here. Chuck's from the Greater Cleveland area. Chuck, you on? You still on? I got 137 people still on at 8:30. I am. <laughs> hey, all right, Chuck. All right, so Chuck says I had. My car sent out for plastic media stripping. Okay, so that's that's a new one. I did not consider that. It removes the paint and filler, but but not the rust. And it won't won't warp the panels. Of course, that depends on who's doing it and what what force they've got behind it. Um, soda blasting may now have replaced plastic media, but I you know I don't know. I don't know. I don't know an awful lot about that. Um, so anyway, uh, pl plastic plastic media was uh, uh, they would it was a little bit bigger chunks and they would uh, blast it at uh, high volume, low pressure. So okay. it, it uh, so it wouldn't warp things. But it is as you said with sand, even the plastic media. It, after the car was restored, it's still, I was shaking out plastic media for a while. For sure, <laughs> for sure, yeah. Very, very cool. Where, where are you from, Chuck, Westlake? Uh, uh, Sheffield Lake now, Sheffield still west Lake. side of Cleveland. Okay, all right. I just want everybody else to, to know, so. Um, and here, uh, and again, we got a note here that Eastwood has a pot blaster for small areas. So you, you don't have to use the same media on the whole car. You can, uh, for instance, you can, you can do use a chemical stripper on the big panels, on the big panels on the wide open area, just don't let it fall into a crevice and then use a small blaster to, to, to get, to get the crevices clean. So lots of, Lots of different ways, lots of, you want to read a lot about this and coordinate with your body, your body shop, because those are the guys that are either going to be happy or mad that you've done something that, that they wanted or didn't want you to, to do. Okay, so this one is from Paul to everybody, but, but putting an electric fan on his 77 MGB. So Hi, Paul, you can unmute yourself. I'm waiting for Paul here. I got a little bit of background. Somebody isn't unmuted, but I don't see Paul here. You know, since I don't see Paul, I'm gonna mute everybody again. Um, and then 
because I got some background noises in some places. So anyway, so Paul says he's planning to install an aftermarket puller fan on his on his radiator on his 77B using the original wiring. Um, it might have the relay installed in the circuit. He's it says it's too cold to go outside and look. It has a GM alternator conversion, and he needs to know how much current uh, this can safely handle. And that uh, that's um, that's the wiring, I guess, going. But the um, that fan, that puller fan, can't draw any more than the original fans drew, and and um, the he says he's getting 18 C, uh, 1870 CFM cubic feet per, per minute, and it draws about 40 amps, um, or about 30 amps when it's running. And um, he says he's currently running a, a, a more inexpensive 800 cubic foot um, fan that runs at 20 amps. So I don't know how many amps or how many CFM the original fans took, but they they take more current than anything else in the car, save the, the starter motor. So I just can't believe that you're going to exceed the ability of the wire to handle it. If you're you know, or 30 amps is a lot of that's a lot of amperage though. So I don't know. Oh, anyway, and he, he apologized and says he doesn't have a, a mic on his computer. So that's why we're waiting forever, but he didn't weigh in. Um, I just don't know. I can't, I, I can't tell you what wire size to use. There's of course a British wire size and there's American wire size. And if there's any question at all, the starter motor is only three feet away. So bring a new lead up from the bottom of the starter motor up to your relay and let the relay run the fan and then you don't have a problem at all. Make sure it's fused, of course. So anyway, we don't know where he's from. Steve Olson uh, might be the sway bar that's warped. That'll twist the height a bit. If it was a rear sway bar, I think that's probably true. Um, Chuck Linick is weighing in on the height issue. Are both the rear lever shocks moving freely and do they both have full travel? If one shock is seized or seizing, that could definitely affect the ride. It absolutely could, but I don't think I've seen a frozen rear shock ever. Now, I'm sure I must have. There must be one out there that I've seen, but I don't remember it. So almost always it's the, it's the springs. Um, and from Jim, who's weighing back in about the silicone brake fluid, what was the problem with an MGA or a T-type? He doesn't say that, but same problem when converting. So Jim, if you're still on and you want to know about silicone brake fluid in your MGA, I'll yes, talk to you here a little bit. So here we go. Okay, so um, the silicone fluid makes almost all those rubber seals swell. It just does. I, maybe some, some, some seals don't swell, but almost all of them do. So on the MGA, I've got a nice drawing. So all I can do is, is gesture here with my hands. The piston is this long and the, it's got the rear seal or the primary seal behind it, primary piston cup behind it. And just on the edge of the lip, of that piston seal is a little tiny, tiny hole, like 1 64th of an inch or something, that goes from the master cylinder bore up into the reservoir, so that when the when that whole piston and cup assembly come back forward, if there's if there's a need for fluid to enter the system, it can get from the reservoir down into the master cylinder bore. The silicone brake fluid can uh, expand that seal, that primary seal in the master cylinder bore, so it covers that hole. Now we get two problems, but the main problem is you start to use the brakes 
the brake fluid starts to heat up and expands. It can't go back up into the master cylinder. It can't relieve the pressure. So the brakes come on a little tiny bit, which makes the fluid a little hotter, which expands mm -hmm. the fluid a little bit more, which makes the brakes come on more, which expands the fluid a little more, and you can end up stopped, stopped, stone, I mean, like, like a mountain, like the car will not move because all four brakes are on. Um, if you got a, if you got a bleeder wrench with you, um, a quarter inch, you just crank a, a bleeder loose, you get enough mm -hmm. brake fluid to, to fill up the top of your fingernail, that's all. It's all free again, off you go. So to prevent that from happening, you have to allow the pistons to come farther forward in the master cylinder than they normally would, which is, on the case of the MGA, cutting a thicker gasket with holes large enough for the pistons to come through so the piston bottoms out on the front cover uh, rather than on the gasket. And um, if you put a piece of cardboard in there that's about the thickness of a cigarette carton or two, works great. It just allows that master cylinder piston to come farther forward by a jillionth of an inch or half a millimeter, whichever is, <laughs> whichever is larger. And, and, uh, and therefore that hole doesn't get covered. So that's the problem. That's the problem with that using the silicone fluid in an MGA or a T-type. The brakes come on by themselves. And worse, the clutch comes on by itself and you'd never know that. And then you've got the, the throat bearing riding against the thrust plate on the pressure plate, so. Well, great, I'll, I guess I'll just put a firewall shelf with some kind of uh, chemical resistant something, I don't. Um, can, um, Jim, I can, I, I um, Call me tomorrow. Find my number on the, on the web on my website, University Motors LTD. Call me tomorrow. I've got a little diagram. I can email. You can email me, John Twist at University Motors LTD.com. I got a little thing that I've written up about how to solve that. You don't have to take the master cylinder out of the car. Nothing. You can do it right in place. It's really easy. So great. I will do that, John. Thank Okey you. Doke. You're very welcome. Where, where, where are you from, Jim? Buford, South Carolina. South Carolina, we've had like three or four people. Yeah, the, so. the home of Paris Island. They make Marines here. Oh, all right. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay, from Rich. He says, I have BMC GN29. Um, so that is, I think that's the yellower of those two greens. That's the new racing green. And the, uh, the darker green, I think, is GN25. But again, you can go back to that list, Caroline's list in uh, the Moss Motors catalog to get the correct name for the color. MGA owners, there were never any really green, green, green MGAs. So MGA owners often will paint their cars. I think it's GN25. It's a nice dark green, looks, looks real smart on an MGA. So thanks. Chuck Linick, there we go. Tom Metcalf uh, is a good source to ask for pre-war cars. Tom Metcalf, it's Safety Fast Restorations in Ohio. I can't remember what town he's in. I was, I've been there, I've been in his shop. Um, I'm blank on the place, but Safety Fast Restorations. He does, he does work that's, that's like Pebble Beach work. Amelia Island work. It's really, really high-end work. And he knows all the guys in the Triple M group. So he'll know who to, who to contact about that, that blown 33 J2. Okay, Dan Lamprecht um, who has weighed in and says, I'm pretty sure a windscreen on an MGB GT is taller than a Roadster windscreen. Dan, you are absolutely correct. It's like two or three inches taller and they're not interchangeable by any, any hint at all. I, I was only answering that guy because I just figured that he was 
he was asking uh, GT to, to GT, and the GT did come out in 1965. We had a guy come to our summer party from Ohio who had one of the very, very first MGB GTs. It was green and the interior was red. It was like a Christmas car. It was very odd, but it was still all, all original. So, Rhinout, Rhinout vote. Rhinout is from the greater Atlanta, Atlanta area now, and, and uh, Rhinout gives us Christmas cheer. Um, happy holidays to y'all. He's doing his best to pick up a, a southern accent on top of on top of his uh, Dutch accent and his Chicago accent that he already has. <laughs> oh, there you are, Rhinout. Yeah. Merry Christmas. Hey, no. Merry Christmas to you, Rhinout. Yep. Merry Christmas to you, Joel. How are you? Great, great. Thanks. What's the temperature today in Atlanta? It was cold. It was 50. <laughs> it was like, I don't know how cold it was here. It's about 25, I think. Oh, my gosh. So, all right. And Rhinout has, a, has, a, has an M type midget or the early like a 20 what a 29 or a 30 it's a 31 31 okay and i i i actually did a uh, send a message to this uh, gentleman in california which is j2 oh good uh, i refer him i checked real quick he's not a member of the register yet okay okay good 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 thank you very very much right now so all right, so we got back to, uh, we're back to Judd, who's got to wade in here. He says, if Paul is overheating in Kentucky, the, probably is, the problem is probably not his fan, but something in the cooling system. And um, that's certainly a possibility. The late model Bs, 77 through 80, rarely need a fan unless you're in traffic. Then game, you know, that it's all together different. But going down the road, you don't need a 77 through 80. It's got a huge radiator and it cools so well. And if your car is out of tune, then you're producing more heat in the exhaust or the radiator than you should be, depending on how, how badly and how it's out of tune. So yeah, those are all, those are all considerations. All right, so here we got a note from Rob N to everyone. Do all Armstrongs leak? Uh, I fill the shocks and uh, it leaks at the rotation of the arms. So Rob, the, an the quick answer is no. Yep. Um, not, not when they're new and not when the seal is good. Okay. Uh, if the, the, the premier rebuilder is, uh, um, his wife's name is Jane. Just a minute. I just had Madison, Wisconsin. Worldwide. Of course, Peter Caldwell. So he, I talked to him a couple of weeks ago and there's the seal that goes on the MGB mm -hmm. is, I think there's only one person left in the whole world that uses that seal and it's him. And he was trouble, he was having trouble trying to get those seals, but he, he'll, he'll have them soon enough and be able to rebuild them. But when you fill up your front shock, it should not leak. The rear shocks only leak until the level's down at the axle. The pistons and the valving lie below the axle. So the rear shocks can leak and actually go bad, but still work. I mean, go bad where the arm, arm is loose from the, from the housing. Midget shocks are, are um, uh, midget shocks are, are don't leak only by the grace of God, I think. There's a lot of, lot of stress on that. They're, they make a, an essential part of the suspension. Well, just like the MGB, but only with one arm. And we'd, we would have been better served if they'd had two arms. What, what year and model do you have, Rob? It's a, it's a GT 1972. And it's mostly the rear shocks um, you know where the um, where the rotation mm -hmm. arm goes in to the shock. I fill them up, and they leak down to the level yep. of that arm going in. 
Okay. So um, the front ones, yeah, the front ones sort of leak around the copper gasket that's at the bottom. They're, you know, or not, sorry, looking at the rear ones. The rear leak, there's a copper gasket at the bottom where you end that at the bottom of the rear ones. Where the valve is, yes. There's a hole in on the top and a hole in the bottom on the rear. And there's a big copper gasket that goes up under the fill under the rain plug, I guess it is. Do you know what size that is? I well, can't find one. We're dealing with a 1972 MGB GT, correct? Yes. Okay. Correct. So and there's only the a, there's, shock. A, there's only a filler at the top. There's only a filler, and that's 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 a British thread. Gosh, you know, there's not many British threads left in the whole car, but that's a British thread. So the proper size on that yeah. um, socket is five sixteenths BSF, but thirteen millimeter works just perfect. Right. Um, the gasket yeah. up on there the, is on the um, bottom. The bottom that there's only a valve that goes in sideways on on the bottom. Um, right, there's a great big filler nut or nut that yeah, holds that that's valve a, in. That's I I I don't. I'll tell you, I don't know those to leak, and I I think that's probably yeah. This, 13 sixteenths. If you put a wrench on that and crank Huge. on it, it, it should snug it up so it quits leaking. Um, okay, because I didn't I, I didn't want to crank it up too much. It's you you can't strip it out by hand. You can pull on that as hard oh, okay. as you want. <laughs> so and and you can also get a rebuilt. Okay. You can also buy rebuilt ones from worldwide import in imports in Madison, Wisconsin. Okay, but it's it's normal for them to leak at the pivoting no, point. No, no, that means that no. that means that the axle's loose, the seal's worn out. Um, they're, they're still working. Yeah, okay. But you're probably getting some clunking back there from yeah. that. So, in changing them, changing yeah. them, it just it leaks to that level. Yes, um, changing them includes taking the, the shock off the car and taking the spring plate off the bottom of the leaf spring. And then you, you're coming away yeah. with an assembly that's got the shock, the shock link and the bottom plate. Yeah. Cause you can't get it apart in place. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. Okay. Well, I cleaned them all out and, uh, and poured the sludge of oil out and, uh, and cleaned it as much as I could with fresh oil. What kind, of oil, what okay. kind of oil did you put um, back? Just put uh, um, uh, hydraulic fluid, hydraulic oil, for yeah. oil. In them. The, um, uh, and then, yeah, because I was replacing the whole hardware on, on, the, on the axle anyway, right? Okay. So there's the U-clamps are changed and that little bump stop thing has changed and I've bolted it all up. But I just got to say that it's just leaking seal. Nah, the, 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 the shock shot to send it in for a and and get a, a rebuilt one and with those shocks you don't okay. have to do you don't have to do them in pairs you don't have to do all four you can just replace the shock that's faulty just just the one okay all right thank you where where are you from rob oh i'm from uh surrey bc in canada okay i've talked to you before about the wiring Yes, yes. The wiring I, pictures you're I'm doing still, your daughter's GT. Yes. Yep, and I'm still I'm, <laughs> I'm just thinking about that today and I thought I've got to get underneath there, but I'm picking up the leaf springs tomorrow <laughs> from the spring shop. So so I'll be underneath there soon enough with my handy dandy camera and I I will I will take those those pictures for you. So okay. Thanks a lot. Oh, great. Thank you. Okay, here we got a note that Tom Metcalf from Safety Fast Restorations is in Mansfield, Ohio. I just, I'd forgotten what the city was. And it's also over on the chat section, there's the phone number and the 
and his email address and so forth. So you can scroll through that. So now Dennis has weighed in here and Dennis says, Dennis, you uh, about the Rimmer's catalog, you can unmute yourself if you're here. Um, from Rimmer's catalog, they list three British racing green colors. So there are, there are three that they list. Um, and, but they're confused because they've got a dark version at a GN29 and a light version for a GN29. And I think one of those, well, that, that GN25 is really nice. There, there is a green color that is so dark, it's almost like black. Uh, Connaught, C-O-N-N-A-U-G-H-T. They used them on the 1100s. It's a really, really dark green. It, it, it colors, I mean, who's to say what color is, is best or correct or anything? It's just whatever you like. So this is a note from Paul. Uh, this is uh, uh, about the clutch release bearing from AP made a few years ago. He said he got it three years ago. Would a bearing installed in 2006 by my shop, uh-oh, now we're in warranty work, uh, with approximately 27,000 miles on it, be a better choice on an overdrive tranny installation? So I think what he's asking is, should he change the release bearing? And it has to do with how far the carbon is up off the face. The rule of thumb is a clutch lasts 50,000 miles under normal use. So this one is nominally half gone. Again, you can take a brand new clutch and ruin it without any miles. And my guess is you can put a, 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 fre a fresh car on the road and get hundreds of thousands of miles if you never touch the clutch. You're on the expressway all the time. So it's hard to say what kind of shape that release bearing is in. By the way, the radiator fan issue, uh, the car, oh, Okay, this is uh, again about the car in Kentucky. Uh, the the uh, radiator, the car cools fine on the road, but it doesn't cool well enough in traffic and you, you just can't have it overheat. So you have to have it cool correctly. All right, so we're down, we're, we're at nine o'clock. I still have a couple more questions here, maybe more than a, a couple. I'll make I'll make my pitch again. We're still we've still got 107 diehard MG enthusiasts hanging on watching. Thank you very kindly. When you're done watching today, please go on my website and find the PayPal button and push the PayPal and give me a little something for my time and effort and support and so forth. I do enjoy when I talk when you call me on the phone. People are are usually effuse in their thanks for my YouTube videos and my ability to answer your questions almost always correctly, I trust. I try never to give any information that I don't know is correct. And sometimes I forget stuff like plastic media, forgotten all about that. I was thinking of walnut shells, but I don't think cars are sandblasted walnut shells. Uh, but anyway, and when I do need help, I'll send you to somebody when I don't have the answer and you need help, I'll try to send you to the person that can help you best. Okay, here we come from Bill uh, with season, season greetings from Kapukasing. I know I've wrecked that, Ontario, where it was 18 Fahrenheit this morning. <laughs> Needless to say, he says the MGB, his 80 MGB is tucked in the garage. So minus 18 Fahrenheit. Oh, I didn't see the minus. Oh my gosh, at 18, does it really make any difference if it's plus or minus? Gosh, that's cold. My gosh, I don't know if it's gonna get, I, that sounds like it's way north. Uh, 
Anyway, Jim, reflecting back to my shop days when you were doing your gearbox seminars, have you ever considered doing Zoom training sessions with a fee for registered mechanics? I've considered that. Daughter, I'm going to chime in here and say yes, he has considered it. And yes, he will be doing it. I will assist him with getting it set up. So I'm very enthusiastic about him continuing to do his uh, enjoyed, pleasurable work so that, you know, he has something to do during the day. All right. That's great. Besides working on your car. So. <laughs> well, that's supposed to be done soon, right? Yes. Yep. <laughs> yep. So anyway, yes, um, my daughter, Barbara, um, and it's, it's uh, lots and lots and lots of us have the advantage of having people either, either still our kids, I have my kids late or grandkids, if they'll even come over to your house and talk to you, um, who know everything there is. It's seemingly about Zoom and, and, and the phone. I mean, the phone has just got, it's just got every, everything. I mean, I know, I know enough to make some jokes about it, but I haven't a clue how any of this stuff works. I do know how MGs work. But anyway, thank you, Barbara, for, for uh, we, we, will, we will do this. We'll figure out how to do it. I wish, I wish that we had, I had a shop where I could still do those seminars. I love doing those seminars. They were so much fun. There are, I've said this before, our busiest gearbox seminar, we had 13 gearboxes apart. One guy who attended was from Milwaukee, around that area, and he had a Healy gearbox, and he was blind, macular degeneration or something. He had been sighted, but he'd lost his sight. He was there with a buddy, and the buddy was doing a, a gearbox, but not the same gearbox as the blind guy. He was the only guy who followed my instructions implicitly, which was like lay everything out in nice, neat rows. He had to because he didn't know where he would have put this stuff otherwise. And his buddy helped him out a lot. But those seminars were so wonderful. And I think we, we sent away, I sent away, my fault. Like, I mean, my student put his reverse gear in his MGB gearbox backwards. But I think that was probably the only problem we ever had uh, with a with a gearbox leaving that that wasn't wasn't crazy. Fortunately, he discovered it before he put it in the car. She said, you always run the gearbox through all five gears, reverse one, two, three, four, before you put them into the into the car. You always do that because it's embarrassing to find out after it's in the car that it won't go into. Oh, I don't know. Second gear, if you've got a midget, MG midget, and you've um, messed up the, the position of the first and second slider, there's all kinds of stuff that can happen. But I wish that we could still have those seminars. I did ask another shop about doing it, and he goes, well, yeah, so what are my mechanics going to do on Friday? <laughs> Either doing during cleanup or if we start it. So... Uh, Every now and then I'll get somebody who's not too far away and he'll come to my little tiny shop and we'll just do that gearbox that day. Uh, but it isn't as much fun as two days and everybody there with their gearboxes apart or their carburetors apart. That's a lot of springs and balls. I had that giant CUDA washer. You could just take a whole gearbox and put the, all the pieces in there and wash it. And we had a huge supply of used, slightly used uh, replacement parts so that if you did pop your first, second sliding hub apart and the springs and balls yeah. flew out, despite my many, many warnings that that would happen if you didn't have it wrapped in a rag, it still did happen or stuff got lost. We had a tremendous supply of stuff to draw from. I don't have that anymore. So I don't mm -hmm. think we'll be having any more on-site seminars, but we'll see about doing that. So anyway, that's that's it. I'm I'm down to uh, uh, oh from from Doug Clark. Uh, thank you, and um, he's he's logged on here at, at the very end because uh, he's already done with dinner. So I want to thank everybody for being here. I think uh, that's the 
into the questions. And if you've got a question, you can unmute yourself. I'm happy to stay on here for a little bit, answer a question or two if you think of something or have a comment or anything. Everyone's muted right now, but you can unmute yourself. I'm not, not uh, stopping you. We still have 85 people online. I could wax on about all kinds of stuff. Doug's in the shadows here, DC. So yeah, nice hat there, Doug. Thanks. When's, when's your next Zoom session? In two weeks or in January? I'm, work, I'm working that out with Barbara and we're gonna post those and we're gonna have a whole year's worth laid out so it doesn't come up at the last minute. Oh, I didn't know we were gonna have one. I mean, that happens to me sometimes too. I already double booked this week. I have I got two Zoom sessions at seven o'clock on, on Thursday, so I can't do one. So anyway, by the first of the year, we're gonna have a whole year's laid out and I'm and we're gonna get this thing sorted out with the uh, um, my constant contact. Barbie wants me to switch over to uh, Chimp. Um, um, what what, what yeah, is sure. it? Mailchimp, uh, because constant contact is a real hassle when I'm trying to put together those little newsletters with the with the pictures on the side. It's not very. So we're going to be next year, right? Correct, correct. I won't see anyone again on here unless you're a member of the British Motor Trade Association. I won't see anybody else on here unless you call me and and we do a. a we do a private pay pay per view. Um, I, I am wearing pants, um, and and uh, yeah, we won't see we won't see each other until 2021. Well, happy holidays to you, John. We all appreciate this, and uh, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, John. Thank you for being on tonight, Skip Vandermolen. Thank you for being on. Skip used to run a nuclear reactor at Michigan State University. Now he just tries to make his, his uh, TB run. So Tom Snook, nice to see you on there. You got a stripe on there, a stripe on your shirt like you're going deep sea diving or something. I'm not sure. No, John, I, I, had, I went from the British American Business Council uh, from 5.30 to 7, and then you, but I've got my cycling jersey on. Oh, all right, okay. I couldn't see it behind the microphone. So, right. Okay. First, I thought it was a diving, a diving flag, and then I thought it was what was left of a Union Jack. So. The whole Union Jack is, uh, and I have my cycling uh, shorts on, so I have, I'm okay. So you are wearing pants. Yes. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. All right. George, nice to see you here. Pleasure. And Christopher, it says Christopher. Which Christopher? With a garage door behind you. Blake. Hi, John. Hey, Chris. I thought it was CP. I thought it was, but the, the, uh, the light isn't on your face, you know, and you've gotten older. Jay, uh, Jay Kirkman called me up about oh must have been about a month ago and he said hey i'm in town want to come and see you i haven't seen him for a long time both, both chris who's uh i'm speaking to right now on on the board and the jay kirkman worked for me some years ago so anyway um jay kirkman started when he was 14 or 15. he couldn't drive i remember that anyway he was just he's a pilot now professional pilot and he was in in town and I said, geez, Jay, I got to ask, how old are you? And he says, 51. So, oh, my gosh, known you guys for a long time. So, yeah, it's funny. Chris, what, what color is your MGA? That's a green MGA. What color? Uh, it's a Ford color, Loden Green. L-O-D-E-N? That's correct. Loden Green. It, it looks just like GN25. It's a real pretty color. I don't know if Rob Tedrow is still on or not, but... Loden Green. I'm gonna write that down. Yeah, that was uh, uh, concept urethane and uh, Loden Green. It's a Ford color. Uh, sometimes those the American colors are, are accessible. You, I mean, you have, they're still, you know, what, no matter what paint system so, someone has today, they can still go back and find it. So Chris wouldn't have painted his, but 
he had an altercation with Sharonda Denise Miller at the at the church, at the corner of, of Eastern and and uh, Wealthy Street. He was hit so hard by Sharonda's car that it bent the rear axle. That's a that's a pretty that's a pretty tough collision. But yeah. looks, looks good today. Well, I haven't seen it. I haven't seen it. In, it's in the background. Uh, okay. but, uh, yeah. No, it's it's all good now. Excellent. But, uh, yeah, it was a hard hit. Excellent. So, nice to see you. He, uh, Likewise. Fun. From uh, Jenison. Correct. Michigan. Right down the road from me. Right up the street from my girlfriend. Yeah. Yeah, you should stop by. I will. Sometime. I'm going to go out. I actually, I'm going to go out and see uh, um, Marty tomorrow. I got, I got Barbie's wheels painted, and he's got tires. I'm going to get those mounted up tomorrow, right after I, I pick up the leaf springs. So. Is Boyson? Yeah, Marty Boyson. Yeah, so he works uh, at an auto, auto auction in Hudsonville. Okay. Yeah, they sell, good. They sell three, 500 cars a week. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's like a combat auto auction. Yeah. So well, what, uh, anybody got any more MG questions? It's 9.09, so in a minute, it's going to be one after 9.09. We can talk about Beatles songs, but we can also talk about the history of the gallon. I keep swearing I'm, I'm going to do that sometime. I will do that sometime. Probably not tonight. Uh, we can. Uh, we got 55 people still on here. We got Bill Rosevear from Michigan City. Bill was a, a firm believer in coming to the tech seminars. How many did you come to, Bill? 20. I don't think 20, but well, probably more than 10. 18. <laughs> Bill was a real some more than one a year. Yeah. 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 I know for a long time. So yeah. Yeah. night, John. Thanks. Thank you, Bill. So Doc. He's an ENT. So retired. So who else do we have here? We we, we got anybody else we, we can tune in with? Uh, Dave Smittle. I see Dave Smittle's picture up. His dad used to come to all the all those uh, that we had so many years ago. Kim Erickson's on. Kim, oh my gosh. Kim Erickson, I went to school at the same time as Kim Erickson. He's got an MGA and a 77B white B. And when I get the two cars in my shop done, I'm gonna bring his car in and revive one or both of them so he can sell one and give the other to his daughter or drive one and I don't know, give the other one to his daughter or something. So. Well, gentlemen, ladies, thank you for hanging on. It's it's now it's two after nine oh nine, and I'm going to take my leave. <laughs> Bill Barge, thank you for weighing in, Bill. Yeah, I liked. I had that uh, on. They they had a. You know, I don't know where you find that off. Um, the the Beatles songs that are recorded, studio recordings that that aren't popular, but they did. One after 909 with steel guitars. Oh my gosh, that is just so nice to listen to. That's one of the earliest, I think one of the earliest songs that they wrote themselves. Anyway, Barbara and I will have up soon uh, a calendar for next year. Thank you kindly. Please go to my website and hit the PayPal button and make a, some kind of contribution. Anything is anything is great, and also I just I forgot to say anything more about uh, MG, the the disease MG. I should have said something about that earlier. Myasthenia gravis. So their poster child is Arist Aristotle Onassis. Didn't matter how much money he had, he couldn't cure himself of the disease MG. And when they were first out. I, I don't know how I even hazarded upon them. Uh, they had a small trifold green flyer with a Jaguar E type on the front of it and said, it said, MG's not just another little car. I said, my God, if you're going to put a car, picture of a car on the front of this, don't put a Jag on there, put an MG on there. And for years, we'd raised money for our local Myasthenia Gravis Foundation. Not very many people are affected. It hits, you know, two per hundred thousand or something. So it, 
it isn't a very popular disease, but it's our disease because it's the MG disease. So we have it, they have it, but they need more help than we do, I think. Anyway, thank you very much to everybody. And uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna sign off. Thank you again. Enjoy 2021. Enjoy the last couple of days of this year. And drive your car. See ya. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas.